Let's look at electro lights and let's have a look at electrolytes and minerals. This is a very brief introduction and I'm assuming that everybody has a more thorough introduction to it in regard to physiology through the physiology course because this is strictly just talking about pulling samples for these uh, specific electrolytes and minerals for dogs and cats in clinic and just some guidelines around that. Terminology, anion has a negative charge, so chloride is an example of that. Cation has a positive charge, a good example is potassium. Functions of these guys, so electrolytes and their associated minerals, maintain osmotic pressure, so maintaining that fluid balance throughout the body. Water balance is the key. Musculature and the nervous system, a lot of these will affect the muscles and conduct energy within the muscles. There's an acid-base balance component and blood clotting factors as well. So electrolytes have a huge role. That's why animals who are dehydrated, we start to get to see major changes in their body conditions and their physiology. We start to see um, increase in heart rate when animals that are dehydrated, they are lethargic, they are weak because all of their electrolytes are often quite unbalanced. So we have to tackle that as our VTs with the doctor's directive to help correct some of these big concerns. And in all, we're talking about homeostasis, so the physiological balance within the body. And with that, we're talking about the water coming in, so the fluid and electrolytes coming into the body, with the balance of the fluid and electrolytes leaving the body. And that's, of course, they're coming in through, oh, I'll talk about that in the next slide. So the electrolytes and associated minerals that we're talking about, so in general, we sometimes refer to everybody as electrolytes, so that's perfectly fine. Sodium, we've got Na, it's a positive. Potassium is a K, it's a positive. Chloride is Cl, negative. Calcium, uh, Ca, definitely positive, and phosphorus, PO4. Magnesium, Mg, positive. Hydrogen ions and bicarbonate are also sort of included within these general talks, but we won't really go into them specifically. But especially when we start looking at uh, the acid balance along with the fluid balance in the body, then hydrogen and bicarbonate are what we'll be looking toward. So when we're taking blood, this is our role, when we're taking blood for these specific tests to check for levels of electrolytes in the body, we have to make sure that the substance we're testing for isn't in the anticoagulant. And to be honest, with a lot of these, we want to avoid an anticoagulant altogether because they can add, uh, they can either increase the value or decrease the value of the electrolyte. So example, we wouldn't want to use potassium heparin as an anticoagulant if we're testing for potassium because of course it's going to give us invalid results. So talk a little bit about sodium. It's most abundant as an extracellular, extracellular cation. Hyponatremia, normal natremia, and hypernatremia are the terminology associated with sodium. So hyponatremia is low uh, blood sodium, normal natremia is normal levels, and hypernatremia is an increase in sodium. Hyponatremia, we talked about in the previous lecture, it's often associated, there's a few different body processes that can cause this, but if we have a decreased sodium and increased potassium in a dog that's showing clinical signs for Addison's, then that's quite often a keystone of Addison's disease. Its most major role is in osmolality of extracellular fluid. So retained sodium is retained water, and in these guys we can start to see abnormal swelling, throughout the body. The most common cause of hypernatremia, so increase in sodium, is dehydration. Normally for sodium samples we're going to use serum. 
We don't want to use sodium heparin, which we typically don't use anyways. We often use lithium heparin as the collection agent, and we don't want to use EDTA for sodium because it can skew the results. So if we use a red top tube, we're pretty much running it safe. We should always remove the plasma and serum from the cells ASAP because those lysed cells can potentially, if we have lysed RBCs or RBCs that are sitting there for quite a period of time, there is potential that they could disrupt and change the sodium value in the serum. And sodium is almost always looked at with potassium. So we're looking at the sodium-potassium ratio in the serum. So adrenal disease, uh, like we said, Addison's really common to have low sodium, increased potassium. Heart disease and kidney disease, we can start to see changes to the sodium and potassium levels in the body. I'll just go back here one second. So with the sodium levels with kidney disease, <clears throat> kidney disease, we're often getting increased levels of sodium because of that continuous dehydration because the animal is diuresing like crazy. And then also, we'll, on the flip side, we'll get low levels of potassium, which will often supplement in an IV bag for these guys. So here we go with potassium, our terminology, hypokalemia, normokalemia, and hyperkalemia. So we've got hypo, low kalemia, uh, low potassium, normokalemia is uh, normal levels of potassium, and hyper, of course, is increased levels of potassium in the body. This is an electrolyte that's predominantly intracellular. So when we're talking about intracellular, extracellular, we're talking about whether or not it lives within the cells for its mechanism of action, or if it's living in that fluid that bathes the cells, so that surrounds the cells for its mechanism of action. Serum potassium gives us little information about the overall potassium in the body, because again, we're often look, not looking at the potassium that's housed within the RBCs, but instead, serum, we're looking at that extracellular type fluid. So we don't always get a clear picture of the level of potassium. Potassium is really key in normal cardiac function, muscular, and nervous system function. So animals who start to have low potassium, like cats with chronic renal disease, they'll start to get really lethargic. They'll definitely have muscle weakness. They can get that uh, plantar stance where their hind feet are fully on the ground and their muscles are not reacting the way that they should. And of course, we can get changes to the heart rate as well. Any imbalance in sodium and potassium, then we have potential for increasing the likelihood of cardiac arrhythmias as well in these guys. So I always think of severe severely dehydrated patients. We can see some crazy cardiac arrhythmias and abnormal heart rates with those guys because their electrolyte balance is imbalanced is incorrect. So plasma is the sample of choice for this one in particular. Platelets release potassium during clotting, so just to keep that in mind. So we, if we were to use a serum sample, there is potential that we're getting an incorrect level because of those platelets as they're clotting with the red blood cells, they're actually releasing potassium as well. So then we would get increased potassium levels. And if we're specifically looking for whether or not the animal has low potassium, that's going to be, uh, that's going to change the results entirely. So do not use potassium EDTA. As you can imagine, that increases our levels falsely. We don't typically use potassium EDTA. We often use that lithium uh, heparin or just regular EDTA. So that's typically okay in clinic. And avoid hemolysis. Because we talked about potassium being intracellular, potassium is higher in the RBCs than plasma. So if we get a lot of lysis, if we get a poorly drawn blood sample where the RBCs have ruptured and burst, then that potassium that uh, normally lives within the RBCs is going to be to, depending on which type of sample we're taking, but if it's plasma, we're going to have a false uh, false level of, of potassium in that plasma that we're looking at because the RBCs are then dumping their potassium intracellularly. So don't refrigerate the sample until after the plasma has been separated from the cells. And again, this has to do with the RBCs sitting there for a period of time with the potential for lysis. And we often see changes in potassium in adrenal disease, heart disease, kidney disease, chronic vomiting, and diarrhea. 
And then I just repeated kidney disease because I, I guess I just wanted to talk about the importance that potassium, because that animal is constantly diuresing, so they are excreting fluids at a higher than average rate because their kidneys aren't functioning properly, then we start to see a diuresis of potassium. So they're just excreting potassium like crazy. And in those cases, oftentimes with our chronic kidney failure kitties and chronic kidney failure dogs, we'll give them IV fluids that are balanced with electrolytes, but then also add intravenous potassium into the IV fluid bag. Now, super, super, super important, can't express this enough. I'm certain you've learned this in pharmacology previously, but I just want to reiterate it. If we are adding potassium, to an IV bag and the cat or dog is being run on that IV bag, when we add the potassium to the bag, this can be said for any drug, but it is really important with potassium. When we add that potassium to the bag, we need to make sure that the line is clamped, the fluids are not running, and the potassium is injected into the bag and then the bag is agitated. So sh not shaking the bag, but rotating the bag top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom, so that we're not getting a huge plug of potassium sitting by the entrance of the IV line, because in that case, if the animal gets a huge whopping dose of potassium, then they can have some major, major challenges with their cardiac function. So potassium is one that we are always diluting for dogs and cats, and it's most often given during IV fluid therapy to rehydrate the animal. We're also giving potassium in the IV bag. So again, Always, always, always clamp the line, stop the fluids, and agitate the heck out of that bag if we've added potassium to an IV bag so that they're not getting a whopping dose of potassium, which would interfere with their cardiac function. Potassium, too, like I mentioned earlier, plays a big role on uh, muscle, ability for muscles to function, to take in energy, to exchange energy and animals that have low potassium. So again, quite often the picture is that chronic kidney disease animal, chronic renal failure, or chronic renal disease in general, it doesn't have to be failure, but they get that low potassium because their body is diuresing like crazy, low potassium, and then they get major, major muscle weakness with this, and they can get that plantar stance in their hind feet. So chloride terminology, hypochloremia, normochloremia, and hyperchloremia. We look at chloride, uh, or the doctor would look at chloride, when we're looking at diabetic ketoacidosis, renal failure, and Addison's disease. So all of these three conditions can affect the level of chloride in the body, and they're often interpreted with the other blood results. So we wouldn't, there's not often a case where they make a diagnosis strictly based on the chloride levels, but they're interpreted with the other electrolytes within the balance and the blood chemistries as well. Calcium is very important, so our terminology for calcium, hypocalcemia, normal calcemia, and hypercalcemia has an inverse relationship with phosphorus, so if one goes up, the other one goes down. Eclampsia or preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is just heading into eclampsia, and eclampsia is a low calcium level in the blood in a postpartum animal. So an animal that is given birth typically one to five weeks ago, the kittens, so the little neonates or the puppies, are feeding, feeding, feeding on the bitch or the queen, and they are pretty much just stealing away her calcium supplies. So with this, we can see a sudden drop in calcium levels in these animals, and when they get this sudden drop in calcium, they will start to look agitated, so they're panting, Quite often they start vomiting, and they start to get major muscle weakness as well, so they start to look drunk. They have a hard time walking, a hard time getting up, and there's a lot more time spent just laying down. There are factors that predispose dogs and cats to getting eclampsia or starting that preeclampsia process. Dogs and cats that are first time, it's their first time having a litter, they're more likely to get eclampsia. Animals that are really good mothers, so very attentive to their litter, uh, constantly nursing their litter, taking really good care of their litter, they are also at higher risk of developing eclampsia. And when we're looking at dogs, dogs who are toy breed dogs are also at higher risk of getting eclampsia or preeclampsia too. So eclampsia technically isn't an overall lack of calcium in the body. It's an indication that the nursing female can't mobilize enough calcium that's stored 
into her body to meet her metabolic needs. So they might physically have the calcium, but the parathyroid gland isn't working the way it should. Normally the parathyroid gland will uh, indicate, send the body messages that it needs to release more of that stored calcium into the body, into the blood to be uh, passed around all the organs. And in this case, the parathyroid gland is not working the way it should. So the parathyroid gland is not getting those signals to the body to release that stored calcium. Animals who are eclampsic or preeclampsic, they'll come to the clinic. It is an immediate emergency. Signs that the owners might call you with are their dog who recently had a litter of puppies or a cat who had a recent litter of kittens, normally within the last one to five weeks. They might be showing weakness. Uh, they're often panting. Panting is a really big sign of that. They can get a weird form of paralysis and they can get really stiff limbs or an inability to walk. So like I mentioned earlier, a lot of just laying down, not wanting to move. And it is an emergency, so that animal needs to come in ASAP. We'll take the blood sample, run that, send it away, whatever he might do. But if the doctor is suspecting that they are eclampsic or preeclampsic, they're going to give it uh, intravenous calcium to correct that immediate drop in calcium. When we're taking these samples, we don't want to use EDTA. It decreases the plasma calcium. And serum calcium is affected by serum albumin. If the albumin levels are abnormal, then the doctor would have to calculate the adjusted serum calcium levels to get an accurate level. Serum phosphorus, so we have hypophosphatemia, normal phosphatemia, and hyperphosphatemia, has an inverse relationship with calcium. So when one goes up, the other goes down, and it's regulated primarily by the kidneys. It's important to know that growing animals have higher serum phosphorus, just something that you might see on pre-anesthetic blood work, that their ALK-FOS has been increased, whereas in older animals, or middle-aged animals to older, sometimes a single increase in ALK-FOS can be the start of Cushing's disease, mm -hmm. so it might mean that the animal has the start of Cushing's disease. Avoid hemolysis, really important. So we have to have a clean stick with this one, a nice clean blood draw. Phosphorus will be released from RBCs and it can cause false elevations if we have hemolysis. And then again, separate that plasma and serum ASAP because we don't want potential lysis from the RBC breakdown to release that phosphorus into the plasma or serum. And we can see an increase sometimes, uh, or sorry, decrease in phosphorus in hyperthyroidism and changes and in renal failure as well. Lastly, magnesium. We don't look at magnesium too much at all, but it's just important to know that it exists and that it's in all body tissues. They do need it and balanced in their diet. So terminology, hypomagnesemia, normomagnesemia, and hypermagnesemia. It is in all body tissues. It's required in order to function, and it's closely related to calcium and phosphorus. And that is essentially it. Anticoagulants will cause false decrease in magnesium, and there again, there are higher levels in RBCs than in the interstitial fluid, so do avoid hemolysis and separate your sample ASAP. Oh, what a weekend this has been. Stars slipped into ships.